from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our audiences worldwide. I'm David Weston. Welcome now to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of businesses. As we come to air, we can break news actually from the President of the United States. He has now tweeted that he will be holding a news conference at the White House this afternoon at 3 o'clock Eastern Time. So he says specifically the topic will be coronavirus with an exclamation point. So we will be hearing from the President in about uh, four hours' time now on the coronavirus right away. This is following, of course, on his remarks at the from the Oval Office earlier this week. It has been a week of full of dramatic market news, and today is no exception, I can say. So let's turn right away to Taylor Riggs here with the latest on where the market is with a, what appears to be a rally. I don't know if to get my hopes up here, but it looks like a little bit of a rally. Yeah, if you get coronavirus exclamation point, that could be peak fear, David. Maybe <laughs> we're all going to go buy on that. So yeah, let's come and take a look at both the major averages. Have a little bit of a rally off the highs of the day, but still after a 10% drop yesterday, 2.5% today, we will take it. NASDAQ, my world of the tech, world uh, gaining as well up almost 3%. I want to focus in on that 10-year yield because the Fed announced yesterday, of course, some repo operations announced again this morning. They're going to go out and buy some of the longer dated maturities, but that's not helping the Treasury market given the risk on feeling you're getting a lift up in yields. That's uh, yield higher there. Um, but the good news is, is the VIX is coming down a little bit, which makes us all take a little bit of a sigh of relief. Take a look at this chart, David. Let me walk you through it because it can get a little bit complicated. The blue line is today. The white line is what happened in 1929. We're looking at the amount of days that you're seeing 4% moves in any given direction up or down. The last time this happened, it was 1929. How about that? Well, a fateful year. Thank you so much to Taylor Riggs. We now are going to be joined by, from Newton, Massachusetts, by former U.S. Treasury Secretary and Bloomberg contributor Larry Summers. This is today's Wall Street Week update. So thank you, Larry, for being back with us today. Uh, we are going to hear from the president at 3 o'clock this afternoon, uh, Eastern Time. What would you like to hear from the president of the United States today? I'd like to see a complete change in tone from bluster and uh, bravado to reflective, somber preparation of the American people for what's likely to be a very difficult uh, period going forward. That's the first thing I'd like to see. Second, I'd like to see the president make it credible to us that at long last, he has a plan to do what dozens of other countries have been able to do, test people uh, in large quantity and take actions on the basis of uh, those tests. Third, <laughs> I'd like to see him em embrace the suggestions that Nancy Pelosi has made with respect to stimulating uh, the economy and avoiding <coughs> the almost inevitable recession consequences of uh, something like this by do, putting as much weight of government behind getting people into money into people's pockets, getting credit uh, into the hands of uh, businesses, taking advantage of this moment to make necessary investments in infrastructure, and perhaps most uh, critically, making sure that people are getting paid for their sick leaves. Let me emphasize that paid sick leave isn't just compassion. It keeps our population healthy by preventing contagion. That's what the studies of flu show, and it's much more important with respect to coronavirus. Larry, it appears, appears we may have legislation by next week. The Senate is remaining behind and apparently is going to ratify this deal that's been reached by Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, with Secretary Mnuchin that would address sick pay for some people, also make the tests free, and also have some family leave pay, things like that. Will that be an important step forward if, in fact, it is passed by the Senate next week? It will, as the mathematicians say, be necessary but not sufficient. Right thing to do for the, for the most part, but that's not going to be enough to make sure the economy stays pr moving uh, forward rapidly, that employers stay hiring when everything is being uh, shut down. So we're going to need much more in the way of direct injections into the economy in the way of maintaining the flow of credit, in the way of international uh, cooperation. But this is a good start. 
And it's a good thing that Nancy Pelosi was able to bring people along uh, to this point. So if you were back either as Secretary of Treasurer or at the White House really advising the president, what is the most effective mechanism to take the next step beyond that first step, that is to really try to protect or ameliorate some of the effects on the U.S. economy? Where would you start? Substantial support to state and local governments um, for Medicaid, which then frees up their budget and lets them to do other things, substantial tax cuts for um, American households delivered uh, in a highly visible uh, sum of money that they're in a position to spend uh, quite uh, quickly, and changes in Federal Reserve procedures and in bank regulations to assure the flow of capital. Those would be the first three things. You were around in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis. You were part of the team that was really putting together the response to bring us out of the great financial crisis as a practical matter. Uh, you had a coordinated team. Is there a team in place that can get this done, and who should be leading that team? Oh, I'll leave the president's personnel choices to the president. Um, I don't see a coordinated uh, team. I, there have been days when Secretary Mnuchin and NEC Chair Kudlow have been saying diametrically opposed uh, things. You don't have a sense of warm collegial working relationships between the administration and the Federal Reserve, and you don't have a sense that there's anything going on internationally. So coordinated globally, coordinated with the Federal Reserve, coordinated within the administration, those are all things uh, that we need to see. Larry, we've seen extraordinarily volatile moves in the markets through this entire week. Uh, you've said before you think it's likely, you even said 80 percent likely, we will be in a recession. Is there a chance we are already in a recession? Because typically we don't know it until after the fact. There's a chance we entered one within uh, the last uh, several weeks. Uh, I'd be surprised if when people look back at these statistics, they'll quite see it as having, having happened. But if it's within the next couple months, that would not uh, surprise me at all. But it doesn't really matter, to be honest, David, because it takes several months for policies to have effect. So any policy that we put in place today, it's likely to be recession time before that policy has its uh, impact. And that's why those of us who have seen these things before are pounding on the table so hard that action needs to be taken now, that this isn't the right time uh, for delay. It's terribly important because you have seen something like this, at least before. Give us a sense, if in fact, counter to factual, uh, if in fact today they were trying to implement some of the things you're talking about, when would we see it really affect the economy? What's the lag that you've seen? If you, if you have a six-month lag on fiscal actions, which is much of what I was talking about, you're doing quite well. Mm. It's possible that you'll have some psychological action faster. When people see that there's good news, stock prices go up, and then that stock price increase starts to engender a sense of greater optimism. That can happen. But in terms of the direct impacts being felt, uh, six months is doing pretty well. And I'm not sure this administration has as much capacity for coordination as that one did, as previous ones did. Okay, thank you so very much, Larry. That is former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers for today's Wall Street Week update. Reminder, you can watch Wall Street Week tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern Time in New York, and that is at 10 p.m. in London. And we turn now to Ritika Gupta for Bloomberg First Word News. Thanks, David. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said she's near an agreement with the Trump administration on a coronavirus bill. The measure would mitigate some of the economic blows from the outbreak. Democrats have been pushing for paid sick leave and more aid to those who lose their jobs. Pelosi hopes to have a deal today. The U.S. has given Roche emergency approval for a highly automated coronavirus test. The Swiss drug maker says it potentially speeds up the ability to test patients by a factor of 10. Testing is crucial to stem the spread of the disease. It allows healthcare workers to identify the infected and quarantine them. 
Another big sports event has been scrapped due to the coronavirus. This time, it's one of the biggest tournaments in golf, the Masters. It was set to be played next month in Augusta, Georgia. The chairman of Augusta National says he hopes the tournament will still be played at a later date. And in Egypt, thunderstorms and major flooding continued for a second day today. At least 18 people have died, many from either electrocution or being struck by rubble when heavy rains knocked down their houses. Schools and many businesses are closed. Egypt has also suspended train service nationwide. The severe weather is supposed to continue through at least Saturday. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks so much, Ritika. Coming up, U.S. stocks are rebounding from the worst day since 1987. We're going to dig into the details with Daryl Kronk of Wells Fargo. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. It would take an oracle to explain what has happened in the markets this week. And fortunately, we have the next best thing to an oracle in <laughs> Daryl Cronk. He's Wells Fargo Wealth and Investment Management Chief Financial Officer. So, Chief Investment Officer. So it's great to have you here, Daryl. Thank you, David. So uh, take your best shot. What is going on? Well, actually, we saw some really good signs yesterday, I think, in the markets. So we pay very close attention. It's interesting, when you get to those signs of capitulation, and you could certainly argue yesterday was, what you tend to see is risk off assets getting sold. So in, in essence, everybody just selling everything. And we saw that in utilities, in REITs, gold sold off, U.S. Treasuries yeah, sold Treasuries off. Yeah, Treasuries on Wednesday they were selling off. That's right. So those are typically good signs that, you know, you've got what we call trapped longs in the business, and they're just needing to get out at any price. So, Joe, help me on this. When yeah. do we know that that's a capitulation as opposed to people just need cash desperately because they have to liquidate? They got margin calls and things like that, which would not be such a good sign. Well, I think it is a good sign because it's forcing all those loose hands out, oh, if you will, right? And so it pushes it out. Once those get reconciled, then you can start getting viable positions coming back in at probably cheap valuations and fundamentals, and that's a little bit of what we're seeing here today. It's interesting, though, you know, well, it'll be interesting in the close today about whether people truly want to hold risk over the weekend, given the headlines are so, you know, back and forth, minute by minute. Well, it also strikes me, we've got three players in this game. We've got the virus itself. Yep. We've got to figure out what's going on with that, right? We've got the markets reacting to the virus. We also have the government, because right. the markets to some extent, and the people are saying, where are we on the government? What are you going to do for us? Yeah, I think you guys have done an excellent job of covering this all morning, which is, Yesterday was all about liquidity, right? And the Fed infused a mammoth yeah. amount of liquidity. In fact, there was a $500 billion repo auction this morning. Only $17 billion was subscribed. Which is a, a good really fact, small right? Amount. Yeah, that's a good sign, didn't right? didn't need it. Um, and, and there was a second one later this morning that only $24 billion mm -hmm. of the $500 billion was subscribed. So the liquidity was, uh, was enjoyed and, and people wanted it. What they really want, the markets want, though, is stimulus, the mm. coordinated stimulus you've been talking about. Um, and they really have yet to get that in any sizable way. Well, and sizable is the question. Right. I, I wonder what, if anything, would satisfy the markets, because apparently Nancy Pelosi has a deal with Steve Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, right now, right. that will go forward. It looks like right now. But that will deal with things like sick pay for people who need that That's for right. family leave. It'll make testing free. It'll help some with Medicare, Medicaid payments. But it's not a big economic stimulus. It's targeted to the people who need it most, perhaps. That's exactly right, David. It's targeted to the workers who are going, going to be most affected by the virus. What the markets really want to see is some targeted macroeconomic stimulus. I think that comes in twofold. One is um, certainly the Fed continuing to deliver on the interest rate cuts that the markets already expect. In fact, the markets are all but pricing in 100 basis points of addition, additional interest rate declines in the Fed funds futures, um, taking us to the zero bound. But what they really want to see is some targeted fiscal stimulus to areas and sectors. So think um, airlines, cruise lines, energy, auto companies, those sectors that are most affected by this. If we could get that or something similar to that, I think the markets would respond positively. So I'm not sure if we call it a sector now, but what about the states? You're starting to hear from governors, we cannot yeah. afford this. Our, you're breaking our budgets here. We need some help from the feds. We just heard Larry Summers, the former Treasury Secretary, saying one of the things that needs to be done is, in terms of stimulus, get it to the states and the local governments. I agree with that, right? When you have a biological issue, you've got to get the treatment, whether that's testing or funds and stimulus, closest to where the impact is happening. So getting it down to the states makes sense. Um, we'll see how much actual capital infusion happens or perhaps maybe the federal government 
eases some of the restrictions about states having to balance their budgets mm -hmm. and allow them to run deficits for some period of time mm -hmm. and actually spend to treat um, and make sure that uh, people are getting taken care of in this moment. So, Daryl, you're a chief investment officer. Yep. What are you advising? What are you doing right now? I mean, do you just sit in cash and just wait till the thing sorts out? Do you put some cash out there? Do you recognize some bargains? Where are you? Yeah, so actually, we've been quite active through this whole thing. So, we did take money away from emerging market equities mm -hmm. and away from what we call ex US developed market equities. So, for all intents and purposes, we think continental Europe, Italy, Germany, and Japan are basically in recession today. Mm -hmm. So we're pulling money out of that. We're bringing it back home, taking it in up quality, U.S. large cap, more conservative names that are now at cheap valuations. We actually upgraded commodities yesterday as well. Mm -hmm. We think you, for, for probably about six or seven years, we've been quite bearish on commodities. We finally got to a point where we think between oil, gold, natural gas, um, it makes sense to add it back into the portfolio. Okay, so, Daryl, as you're speaking, there's a red headline that's crossing the Bloomberg that President Trump is going to declare a national emergency over the coronavirus. We knew earlier he tweeted that he was going to be having a news conference at the White House at 3 o'clock, and now apparently this is something that had been speculated about before. There's a federal statute, actually, the, that's right. the National Emergencies Act, that gives him certain powers. Uh, does that give you some indication he is ready to step up in a big way? Yeah, I think that's the first step, and what that does is it allows him to unleash some funding that he can apply directly, and in some cases even end run the congressional approval and all the politics back and forth. Um, there's been discussion in the administration for uh, better than a week about potentially using FEMA funds, federal emergency management uh, funds, um, to treat the coronavirus. So I think this is the first step of, of getting that to happen, David. At the same time, part of the question is what does the money go for? Uh, and, and every time we've talked to Larry Summers, he said, first, let's address the public health issue. That's right. And, I mean, I just keep coming back, maybe fairly, maybe unfairly, to the testing. Are we doing enough testing? Do we know how many people really have this? Uh, do we need the government to step in, in a big way and say, let's get our arms around this and make sure we're testing enough people? I think you're exactly right. I don't think we know how many people have it. I don't think we've done a terribly good job of testing up to this point. In fact, if you were to talk to public health officials in a compare contrast of the U.S. versus other countries, we have probably, by their measure, fallen short. So this funding will go to accelerating um, testing, hopefully getting to a vaccine at some point where we can really treat this and, and curtail the spread of it. That is priority one. Priority two becomes then stimulus and the countervailing impacts of the macroeconomic effects. Well, so I just want to follow on what you were talking about before. The report now is that the president, as part of this um, national emergency, will invoke the Stafford Act. And the Stafford Act actually specifically goes to FEMA. Right. and says that you can deploy m funds through FEMA. So it appears, it appears that President Trump is taking those steps to say, okay, we're going to get FEMA involved. We're going to declare a national emergency and get on this. Yeah, I think uh, that's not surprising, right? I mean, that's been a lever in the administration's toolkit. And frankly, at this point, I think it's an okay lever to pull, right? Because you actually have uh, an ability to apply those funds very quickly. It doesn't mean they still shouldn't put right. fiscal stimulus together and bring it through Congress in a secondary effort. This is going to take a lot of coordinated effort, I think, as Larry was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to get started on it ASAP. Seems clear. Well, apparently we'll hear about this afternoon. Thank you so much to Daryl Cronk of Wells Fargo. Always great to have Daryl with us. This is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. I'm David Weston. We're going to return to that news breaking out of Washington right now. President Trump is reported will declare a national emergency over the coronavirus, invoking the Stafford Act, which allows him to bring in FEMA as a practical matter. He is going to have a news conference at the White House at 3 o'clock this afternoon, Eastern Time. And of course, we turn to our chief Washington correspondent, Kevin Cirilli. It's in Washington. It's all happening right now, Kevin. What do we know? Yeah. Well, here's what we know. President Trump set to declare a national emergency and invoke the Stafford Act. Now, we should note the president has utilized the Stafford Act several times in his presidency for natural disasters in the central part of the country. Uh, other presidents have also previously utilized the Stafford Act uh, in order to combat uh, natural disasters. Think back to 2000 when former President Bill Clinton utilized it for the West Nile virus. What does it do? Essentially, it allows the federal government to utilize FEMA 
in order to more quickly address and more rapidly address a type of national crisis, in this case, the coronavirus. So it will likely free up uh, more additional funds uh, from FEMA. It will also allow FEMA to more quickly and more re readily work with a local uh, and state officials on the ground in outbreak spots where the coronavirus has particularly spread rather quickly and allow them to come in and really work more with the federal government. So, Kevin, this is, of course, breaking news. We don't know. The president hasn't announced it yet, but, but just bear with me here for a second. In FEMA, we typically think, as you say, it's a natural disaster. It's a specific place they go into and they rebuild houses. They provide for people to have shelter, things like that. Do we anticipate this would be directed at places, particularly that are hot spots in coronavirus, rather than a broader-based approach to, for example, uh, sick pay for people who have to stay home? I think it'll be a combination of both. I think that Congress was, is grappling with the economic stimulus in terms of that front, in terms of, uh, the, in terms of how to best aid the economic relief efforts. But FEMA would be able to do an approach as it relates to, to truthfully really getting into these communities and doing things. The president this week alone, David, has said that he it was openly discussing whether or not to use the Stafford Act. He had said that it would allow him to have more powers in terms of, more, uh, in terms of addressing this. Uh, so again, the Stafford Act is something that has been utilized in this presidency before uh, and, and in other presidencies in the past. Uh, and again, is, is, is really people should start thinking of FEMA when they yeah. think of Stafford. Uh, and that's where we are. So, so, Kevin, it appears maybe we're on two tracks here. One is the FEMA route, the national emergencies, very specifically directed. On the other hand, we also have that reported deal between Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, and the Secretary of Treasury, Steve Mnuchin. Is that a done deal? Not yet, but likely. Uh, they're, they're hammering out the details, as sources have put it to me. Uh, there's intense optimism surrounding that economic stimulus package uh, that lawmakers are working on. And just one other note, that in addition to the Stafford Act and the president's likely declaration of a national emergency and, and likely invoking the Stafford Act, we should note uh, that they are also working with the private sector to make tests more readily available and free for m many more Americans. And the Stafford Act could actually speed along that process. So it's really the public and private partnership and on a national emergency level now uh, that the president is trying to orchestrate. Well, that's a great point. If it could speed up those tests, I think that could be yeah. a game changer. At least a lot of us are really speculating about why we aren't doing more testing. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's chief Washington correspondent, Kevin Sorley, reporting, of course, from Washington. Up next, Asian cities like Singapore and Hong Kong have been able to slow down the number of new virus cases. We discuss how they did it and with we, that how we could learn about the United States. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. From New York, this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Ritika Gupta. Thanks, David. Two political enemies may form an unlikely alliance over the coronavirus. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says she's close to an agreement with the Trump administration on an aid package. The bill would mitigate some of the economic damage caused by the outbreak. Democrats have been holding out for paid sick leave and more help for the unemployed. A deal could be announced today. More Americans will be getting tested for coronavirus. Health officials say now that the private sector is getting involved and producing tests. There will be many more available. There has been growing frustration that the U.S. wasn't able to match the response of nations such as South Korea, which is testing 10,000 people a day. Canada's parliament is shutting down for at least five weeks. The government says the move is to keep lawmakers from contributing to the spread of the coronavirus. This comes after Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's wife tested positive for the virus. The Prime Minister has been in self-imposed quarantine. And the British government is battling criticism of its coronavirus plan. It blends blunt talk of the pandemic's toll with a number of modest steps. The government plans to shift away from efforts to contain the spread of the disease. Instead, it's trying to delay the worst of the virus. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on quick take by Bloomberg. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg, David. Thanks so much, Ritika.
President Trump is now going to declare a national emergency, we're told, over the coronavirus as the number of cases here continues to rise. But over in Asia, places like Hong Kong and Singapore, they've seen signs the epidemic may just be leveling off. Joining us now is global affairs analyst Michael Bersirku, who has been worked and lived in Southeast Asia and has written about what we might learn from their experience. So, Michael, welcome, Michael. It's good to have you back with us. Good to be back. What can we learn from Singapore? Well, a heck of a lot. Number one is to be proactive and not reactive like the Trump administration. Singapore had about a two-week lead in terms of doing things like restricting travel from China. And as you know, they have very good relations with China. But they said no uh, visitors from the Chinese mainland. And also uh, things like uh, micro-tracing, contact tracing, finding out where the uh, outbreaks actually happened in Singapore. And then, you know, Singapore admittedly is a bit of a nanny state. So they, <laughs> you know, people listen to them a lot more, to the government rather. So things like like um, calling people out for what they call socially irresponsible behavior. For example, seniors, no more line dancing, no more card <laughs> table playing, things like that. So, and then, as you know, the former, the founder of modern Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, yeah. I've interviewed him many times, a renowned germophobe, but he instituted a lot of practices way back then that has helped Singapore retain, you know, fight this. But as I recall, there was a conference in Singapore that, in fact, there were some cases they came out of and they got distributed around. How did they handle that? Because at one point, Hong Kong, Singapore was something of a hot spot. It was a hot spot, but if you look at the numbers today, they're, they're, the line went like this and then flattened out. So there are well under 200 cases mm. in Hong Kong as well. Um, very, very strict, again, uh, tracing measures, but also quarantine measures. So you're sure that those people have spent the minimum 14 days uh, well supervised and cared for. And then, you know, we're talking about proactivity. The Singapore government is throwing everything they have at this in terms of people, but also money already preparing gig workers for no uh, no work for the next while. Is that right? Because that's an issue yeah. here. People have asked about gig workers, for example. Where do they end up in this? If you're an Uber driver or a Lyft right. driver or something like that, how, how do you get taken care of? Um, basically financial protection. I mean, Singapore has huge reserves, as you know. But also um, the prime minister the other day said people who have lost work will also be protected. So that kind of releases the hot air. It doesn't make people anxious because I think that's what's happening here in the United States right now. People don't know what is going to happen tomorrow. So um, they do benefit from huge reserves that can help people through this. We just had an announcement that uh, the Canadian Parliament shut down for six months, but now we have a redhead that says that actually the Trudeau government is seeking advice on a stimulus package. To your point about what was go what's going on in places like Singapore, they're saying, uh, do we need to get some serious stimulus in here? Absolutely. You know, uh, the province I come from, British Columbia, is very dependent on Asian tourism and Asian business. A lot of companies are really struggling. They were even before this virus hit. So stimulus will be important. But I think uh, the main thing right now is being very creative, thinking outside of the box, like the Singapores of the world, looking forward and saying, what is going to happen? And I think at the end of the day, Dave, uh, Dave, this will also restore some confidence in the business community. What your viewers hate the most, I think, is uncertainty. Yes, no question. Yes. No question. But, but in Singapore, I think the business community has had a good deal of confidence in the government, right? I mean, as you say, it's a nanny state, but yeah. it gets yeah. the job done. Absolutely. I mean, for example, um, they, their airport is an example of this. They, they're proactive. They expand before it's uh, over capacity. They reclaim land years ahead of time before land is needed in order to make enough space for new businesses. But you know, it's amazing when you think about it, uh, their airport is one of the key transit hubs in the world. And yet they were able to take proactive action and stem a big outbreak because they had, did have millions of people from China, for example, passing through or visiting Singapore. It's quite extraordinary. At the same time, we would say normally you give up some freedoms for that. You don't have the freedom to do quite as much in Singapore as you can in the United States. Right. Do we need to reevaluate uh, re that in the United States about the extent to which we want to go where we want to go? Absolutely. Um, Americans have to be ready for uh, giving up uh, freedom of movement, giving the prized freedoms that they're used to. Uh, the WHO has said time and time again, David, is that social distancing is a big, big factor. You know, don't, uh, don't have events and don't call meetings, but do things virtually. And then one more thing, um, I talked about this in my podcast the other day. It's going to be really interesting to see what this virtual working does for the economy. Will it finally kick in? I think we're going to be catapulted 10 years ahead. Well, it's interesting whether we ever go back to the way we were. It may be, it may be a longer term change than that before I, we get done. I, yeah, I don't think we will. I think uh, yeah. we've catapulted ahead of about 10 years where this will become more the norm. Right. Big question is, will uh, bosses trust their employees to do a lot of their work from home or remotely? Fascinating. Okay, thanks for, so much for being with us, Michael. That is global affairs analyst Michael Basirku. Uh, for an expert view on where we are with the coronavirus break back here in the United States, we welcome now Dr. Pauline Rose now. She's professor 
Professor Emeritus of the University of Texas Health Science Center School of Public Health. Dr. Rose now, now comes to us from Sarasota, Florida. So welcome, Doctor. It's very good to have you with us. We now are here that the president's going to have a news conference. He apparently is going to declare a national emergency. Maybe some of the funds becoming in it will help us with the testing. Is that an important step in the right direction? It is. And the problem is it's late in coming and the initial response from the federal government was inconsistent and contradictory. We did not have a czar at the federal level taking care of this issue. That left it to the states. Lots of states are doing a good job. Others are really scrambling to try to catch up. Our response was late, really, really late. In, in, and so here we are trying to catch up with what other countries are doing and put in place the measures that we really need at the state and local level. We just got a, a headline cross that the Brazilian president, Bolsonaro, has tested negative for the coronavirus. So there's a piece of good news, somebody who does not have the disease. Talk to us about testing, because those of us who are not professionals the way you are can't quite figure out why we can't get the testing going. Because we weren't prepared, and that wasn't a priority, and we didn't have somebody, again, at the federal level, seeing to it that we did have these measures in place, as other countries did. We can learn from other countries, as your previous speaker mentioned, at Singapore. We've really got to get on to that. Let's be humble. Let's be honest. This was an emergency. We missed it. We missed the first opportunity to really, really make an impact. But we can learn for future emergencies, and that's what we have to do. And we have to look at the states. That's the wonderful thing about having 50 states. We can look at the states, see which ones have done the best job, and by golly, let's imitate what they're doing at the federal level. So there's no question after this is over, the after action report, people are going to say, what can we do to plan for the next viral epidemic? Because there will be one. But what about this one? How, what can we do to catch up, uh, specifically on the testing front here? We heard from Dr. Fauci yeah. yesterday yeah. saying, you know what, it's been something of a failing. We weren't prepared to test a lot of people. And how, how can we catch up with that? The first thing for every individual to do is to go online and look at the CDC. This is where we, or the National Institutes of Health, or the WHO, that's the World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control. Look at their webpage. It gives you all the information you need to be safe right now and for the, and the, for the weeks that come. Everything you can possibly imagine, it's there. You just have to access it. And if you have an iPhone, or if you have any kind of Samsung or other apparatus mm -hmm. that will get you onto the internet, go there. Look at the detailed suggestions. Wipe the counters down with water that's got four teaspoons, a quart of water, four teaspoons of bleach. We can all do that. We all have bleach kicking around. Check the other suggestions. There are many and they're all good and they will work. This leadership is coming from our health, public health communities. Take advantage of it. There's no need to worry. Take some action. And to know what to do, again, Centers for Disease Control. And my nine-year-old grandson said, just ask Siri. And if you just ask Siri, <laughs> she will send you to the CDC webpage. That might work for me a little bit better, actually. That's a, good, that's a good suggestion. But give us a help as a public health professional, really knowing this. What should the protocol be? Because at one point we heard uh, from the White House that really what we should be doing is focusing on testing people who have symptoms. Is that right? Because I think a lot of people are concerned about what I think is called community-based transmission, where we don't know where it came from. Should we be right. testing yeah. much more broadly, even randomly, to get a sense of yeah. how big this problem is? Well, that's the kind of thing that health professionals have done in the past. We're not ready for that. And in the absence of that kind of competence, we're scrambling to do the best we can. And if you look at any website, they say you have to take care of yourself. That's a cop-out. We really should have a program that tells us what to do. And we do have it, but not from the, from the government. Some states are doing a great job, but again, we know what to do. And to protect yourself, which is, you know, the fallback right now, you have to do things like not touch your face, right. wash your hands. That doesn't mean, like my older grandson, two minutes under the faucet and bang, I'm done. It means really scrubbing and scrubbing between your fingers and in your palms with a lot of soap. And do that often, even if you think my hands are clean already. Mm -hmm. How many surfaces have you tr tr touched? Go around the house, take that, that leach and water that you've made together and mixed together appropriately, 
and wipe off the doorknobs, wipe off the door handles, the TV remote. That's the worst right. place right. of all. Your right. TV remote is more dirty than your toilet. That's Did you know tip. that? I, I'm, not, I'm not surprised. I'm not sure if I knew it, but I'm not surprised. <laughs> Thank you so much, Doctor. It's really great to have you with us. That's Dr. Pauline Rose Thank now. You. She's Professor Emeritus at the University of Texas. Coming up, he represents 12.7 million members across the United States. AFL-CIO President Richard Trumka is here to tell us how his workers are dealing with the coronavirus. That's next. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. The coronavirus shows every indication that it's going to touch just about every aspect of American life. And one of the most important keys to what it means for the country will be the effect on our workers. As president of the AFL-CIO, Richard Trumka represents over 12 million of those workers. And he comes to us now from Washington. So, Mr. Trumka, thank you so much for joining us. First of all, just give us a sense from your point of Dave, view. How are those 12? On. How are those 12 million workers doing? Well... Look, we're like doing like everybody else is out there. The American people face uh, two threats right now. They face the threat of a real disease, coronavirus, and they th face the threat of fear, fear that could actually divide us when we need to come together. Every American is going to be affected by this situation, some more, some less. There are old elderly people right now that are in a, in a home that can't see their loved ones, and they're going to get lonely. There are workers that are going to get laid off. There are workers that are going to have to change the way uh, that they do their job. Teachers are going to have to teach online. Other jobs are going to change because of all of this. And then you have a worker right now, you have a nurse somewhere in this country right now that's about to treat a patient uh, with, that has the disease. And that nurse knows that the protective equipment that she or he has been issued is inadequate mm. to protect them. Mm. But they're going to be asked to treat that patient, risk their own lives and their families' lives because we haven't received, they haven't received proper protective equipment because of conscious decisions that were made by this administration. Boy, that's very sobering. Talk about your workers, the, the employees that you represent, because you have a lot of collective bargaining agreements. Some of the issues that are coming up right now are things like sick pay. Uh, a, a parent who has to stay home with a child who's out of school or somebody who has to self-quarantine. What sort of provisions do you have? I know they're very bargaining agreement by bargaining agreement, but what sort of protections do you have for those people? Are they relatively okay? Many of our contracts have sick pay and have family leave pay that will allow us to get pay when we're off work. We also have benefits uh, for unemployment. You have health care extensions and, and things of that sort. But there are millions of people out there that won't. And that's why we faced, we asked for free testing so that people that are making low wages wouldn't not be able to afford those tests. Two, we ask for there to be paid sick days for those workers out there that don't have those sick days mm -hmm. and don't have the benefits of a union and collective bargaining. We've asked that unemployment insurance be extended because this is going to be a unique circumstance probably that takes us into areas that we haven't been for periods of time that we haven't been there, so we're going to need that. We also ask in that bill that there be a temporary standard that would have protected the frontline workers of this country. It would have mandated that they get the proper health and safety uh, equipment. And this administration blocked that provision yesterday. Uh, and I can tell you, it's unconscionable. And it's going to put workers at risk, needless risk, that they shouldn't have to face. Uh, one of the big employers in the United States today came out with a statement, Jim Hackett, the CEO of Ford Motor and said, we want to have as many people as possible work from home. It's something that's going on all around, including right here at Bloomberg. We're talking about more people working from home across the country. Is that feasible for AFL-CIO workers? I mean, if you're working on a line, how do you work some, from home? So, some workers can work from home. Others can't. Uh, if, if you're a nurse, you're a doctor, you're a teacher, uh, you are a food care worker, those type of things, you have to be on the job for the rest of society to be able to continue to function. Uh, some people can work for home, and that will help mitigate the effects of this disease. But those that can't should be issued adequate protective equipment so that their health and safety uh, isn't jeopardized because they're doing their job to help the rest of society. They shouldn't have to pay a price just because they're doing what's best for us. 
as I say, you represent, I think, 12.7 million workers across the country. That's a lot of employers. But in general, as you go to the CEOs or whoever the, the, the senior leadership of these companies are and you try to work through some of these issues, are people receptive? Are they working with you to try to take care of some of the problems you're identifying? Some are. Uh, we're partnering with a, a lot of, uh, of employers. But what we faced at the beginning of this, uh, this administration, when it first took over, killed a standard that would have required employers to have a plan to educate their members or their employees and to give them proper safety equipment. Uh, the Trump administration killed that early on in their uh, administration. And so we had to take on the job of training our frontline workers and helping them get the equipment that they need. They're shorthanded. Most of the protective equipment in this country that's stockpiled is too short and it's antiquated. We are far behind the curve of most countries out there. We need to catch up and we're not because of the thing, conscious decisions that have been made. You've mentioned the Trump administration a few times now. Give us a sense. You must be talking with people over at the White House. Uh, what is the sort of discussion you're having? Are they receptive? Are they listening to you? Yesterday, there was a series of negotiations that went on where we tried to get a temporary uh, safety standard in place. Uh, they absolutely blocked that. That safety standard would have required employers to provide adequate safety equipment to frontline workers that are jeopardized, and they blocked that. They blocked it and blocked it and blocked it. They put everything in front of the well-being of America's workers, and I can tell you, David, that's unconscionable. That's unconscionable. OSHA right now, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration that is supposed to protect our health and safety, has fewer inspectors and health specialists than any time in its history. And it's been without a leader for a couple of years right now. This, this administration spent 12 times more on immigration enforcement than it did on worker health and safety. That's a, that's a priority that is distorted and twisted. The American worker deserves better than that, particularly those that are out on the front line right now protecting the lives of others. They shouldn't have to sacrifice their own well-being and their family's well-being because they had the courage to conquer fear and fight against this disease when they knew they had inadequate safety equipment. So, so just briefly, on the specific issue of equipment that you've raised, it sounds very troubling. Is that something that the administration can do without the Congress, or is that something they have to go to the Hill for? First of all, it was a, a, it was a guideline from the CDC. The guideline said that uh, you have to have uh, respirators when you're dealing with people that you know have coronavirus. They changed that to just be a face mask. Hmm. And a face mask is inadequate. The second thing they did, and it was just this week, David, that they changed this. The second thing they did is said, you used to have to have people that had the disease in an isolation, airborne isolation room. They changed that. You no longer have to be in an airborne isolation room. You can now be anywhere in the hospital. Mm. So the likelihood of containing the disease is going to be less because of those two decisions. Frontline workers are going to get this disease because they don't have proper health and safety equipment to protect them. Well, I'll always remember that story about the nurse that you said. <laughs> There's some nurse out there today who's having that experience. It's really memorable. Thank you so much to Richard Trumka. He's AFL-CIO president. We're going to have more with him coming up in the next hour on Bloomberg Radio. Coming up here, there was a big disconnect in the bond market this week, uh, targeting a massive illusion of uh, liquidity, infusion of liquidity from the Fed. We're going to hear from BlackRock's Rick Reeder on what happened. This is Bloomberg. We have some breaking news right now. We've just learned that the G7 leaders are scheduling a teleconference to talk about the, tele the coronavirus crisis. That's going to be coming out on Monday. G7 leaders are going to be teleconferencing with each other on Monday to talk about coronavirus. And it's time now for a highlight from today's Wall Street Week, which is going to be airing at 6 p.m. this evening, New York time. One of my guests is Rick Reeder. He is BlackRock's chief investment officer of Global Fixed Income. And we discussed the Fed's recent action that was just yesterday to tackle the enormous problem of coronavirus. 
it was awe-inspiring in terms of the amount they did. And listen, when you put that sort of liquidity in, you know, you were starting to see pressures in the last couple of days on the mortgage market. Listen, the mortgage market, when you bring interest rates down, mortgage rates are supposed to come down in a parallel way, if not more so. Mortgage rates actually were moving higher. Why was that the case? The system is gummed up. You needed to provide better funding, which, was, which happened. You need to provide better liquidity. And the other thing that I don't think people consider enough, when you put liquidity in the system, it takes pressure off the dollar. We operate in a global financial system. When you take pressure off the dollar, it, take, it makes it easier for emerging markets. So let's emerging markets go and enact policy on their, on the, on their own. That is a really big deal. Liquidity gets in the system, and it's got, it's got a real velocity to it, and they addressed it, and they had to do it. But you were seeing some cracks in the mechanism, mm -hmm. and you can't buy other assets. You can't buy equities. You can't buy credit until the core asset, the risk-free rate, is solved. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, the, it's the number one use of collateral in the world. It's what we build. I always call it the fan of dispersion. Mm -hmm. Until you know where the risk-free rate is, I can't build my models to how do I think about all the way down to equity. Mm -hmm. And, and so you have to fix that asset, and they did. Rick, Rick Reeder of BlackRock. The full episode of Wall Street Week will be airing tonight at 6 p.m. in New York time, and that's 10 p.m. over in London. And you can also catch it everywhere online. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. In our second hour, we're going to have more with Richard Trumka of the AFL-CIO. And we're also going to get a C-suite view on the coronavirus from former CEO of HP, that is Carly Fiorina. This is Bloomberg.